Hi, peeps. Um, okay, so here we are, unit three for chemistry. This is actually matter part two. So you might wanna put that if you're writing these down as, um, as your title. And we're gonna talk mainly about physical and chemical properties and physical and chemical changes. So again, um, pretty straightforward stuff, pretty, pretty much stuff you've heard of before. I know we covered it when you guys were in physical science, if you were at Westland. Um, and so really straightforward, short, short little unit again. All right, so starting with physical properties. These are properties that can be measured or determined without changing the chemical composition. So basically you are, um, for the most part, using your five senses to make observations about a substance. Um, so for example, sulfur um, is an element, it's S by the way. And if you look at it, you would determine that its color is yellow. If you measured it, if you took you know, a block of sulfur and measured the weight of it and then found the volume, you could determine its density. Uh, if you attempted to to, um, to melt it, and if it was in a solid form, it would melt at around 119 degrees Celsius. And if you boiled it, it would be 444 degrees Celsius. All of these don't change the sulfur atoms themselves. So if you if you let it cool back down um, from boiling it, then um, and let it then solidify, it would just be sulfur again. Um, and so it could also include odor it, we could talk about taste although it wouldn't taste sulfur how are you the texture all those kinds of things um one big one that i want to to highlight for um for property for physical properties is solubility in water um here's the deal with that one people always want to tell me that it's a chemical property because like you dissolve sugar in water and you can't see it anymore it appears to be gone but if you let the water evaporate or you boil the water away, then you get the sugar back. Um, and so that, that whole solubility um, um, is a big deal and especially the water because it's not doing anything, it's just dissolving it. Okay, so now physical properties are divided into two groups, intensive and extensive. Intensive are um, a little bit more um, useful in identifying a substance because they depend on the arrangement of molecules internally. So some properties that could be used to identify um, based on, on what's inside the density, so how closely packed the particles are on the inside, the melting point, which is the bonds, um, you know, how much how much does it take to break those bonds, the boiling point, how much does it take to, to um, totally release the bonds, freezing point, of course, the same thing. Malleability, remember that's if you can, can shape it. Um, ductility, pull it into a wire, conductivity. So all of those are very dependent on the internal structure. Um, now, other intensive properties that could help but are not necessarily as um, definitive are the taste of something. Again, we put taste on here, but that doesn't mean you should taste everything. Okay, people die. Um, color, again, that, that is an intensive property, but it's definitely not one that you could use solely to identify something. Odor, crystalline shape, so that is what like an individual crystal would look like. Um, so these intensive properties are, are a little bit more um, specific to a substance. Now, even if you do have a very, you know, a very um, specific Thing like melting point, you usually would want to know a couple of the other properties before you um, can positively identify a substance. So that's that's these properties. Now, extensive physical properties are just way too general. They can tell you an amount, um, but by themselves, they can't identify a substance or describe it um, in any other way than just a general description. So it's like me saying, you know, Okay, go into the science room and bring me the thing that is um, a square. You know, you there are multiple things in there that you could try and figure out. Or if I say, okay, go into the science room and bring me the the three pound object. Okay, that that's not. But if I if I was more specific and you had the equipment, then I could say, okay, find me the thing that has this density or that is malleable or that is you know. So. Extensive, it is a description, but it is not, um, it is not um, an identifying description. 
Okay, so chemical properties. These are properties that once you figure out that they are that substance, then you've changed it because they cannot be measured without changing the chemical composition. So you're going to look for words like it reacts explosively, combines with, forms. And so in all of these, like that first one, hydrogen reacts explosively with oxygen to form water. <clears throat> so those two things do combine to form water. But once I combine them, I don't have hydrogen anymore. I have it with, I have it in water along with the oxygen. And so that's, you're changing the substance um, once you have done this chemical reaction. And so you know what it is, but then you don't have it anymore. Uh, now, these changes in matter. So um, if we change a physical, if we do a physical change or a chemical change, um, first thing to know is that everything involves energy, whether it's, you know, a small change like physical change or a big change. So everything involves energy. And if energy is absorbed, it's endothermic. And if it is released, it's exothermic. That should be old news to you guys. Now, with physical changes, like I said, very small amounts of energy. And what you're doing essentially is moving the particles either closer together or farther apart, but you're not changing the particles. Okay, so it's still a piece of paper even if I rip it in half. Okay, now the pieces can be farther apart. All right, so you don't change what the actual substance is. And with physical changes, there are actually four different types. Um, the dissolving in water, we already, I already kind of emphasized that. Remember that. Um, if I take sugar and I dissolve it in water, still sugar in there, but now the particles are dispersed throughout the water. So I've just moved them farther apart. Um, the change in phase or state, if you go from a solid to a liquid, oh, my arrows are really messed up on there. But if you go from a solid to a liquid, that is sublimation. A solid to a gas, okay, solid to gas is sublimation. A solid to a liquid is melting. Um, liquid to gas is boiling or vaporization. Liquid to solid is freezing, a gas to a liquid condensation. So those, again, are just either moving the particles far apart or closer together. Okay, so nothing is changing in the substance. A piece of ice is still H2O, just packed together, whereas steam is still H2O, just way far apart. Okay, so, um, so going from one phase to another is very simple. Um, changing in the size or shape. So like I said before, you tear a piece of paper in half, still paper. Uh, and then warming or cooling. Now this is essentially, you know, like taking, you know, like a frozen dinner and warming it up. Okay. Frozen mashed potatoes and warm mashed potatoes. Maybe, you know, they may taste a little different, but they're still potatoes. Okay. So again, you're not changing the substance. All right, now last thing, um, chemical changes. So these require way more energy than physical changes, and the reason for that is because they change the identity of the substance, which means you rearrange the particles, you change the bonds, you stick stuff back together. Um, and there are five observations, and different books have different lists on here, but the five observations that tell you a chemical change has occurred, first of all, change in color. So if you mix two clear liquids together and all of a sudden you need to get like a bright yellow, like you will in some of the labs we do, chemical change, something new is there. A change in temperature. Now this is different than the frozen potato stuff. This is where you mix two things together and, and it becomes warm on its own. I'm not adding heat to it. You're not putting it all over the Bunsen burner. You're not you know, cooling it down in the refrigerator. If it is internally changing, and the temperature is affected in an obvious way. That's a chemical change. Um, a change in odor. So this one, you know, um, kind of a not as pleasant example is like milk. Um, you know, if, the, if you check the milk in your refrigerator and you notice that the date is, you know, close or you're even past that date, oftentimes you will smell that milk, and I hope you do. Um, and you will notice a distinct odor if a chemical change has occurred, if that milk has gone from good to bad. Um, formation of a gas. So if you um, put two things together and it bubbles, like, you know, simple, easy one, and of course is vinegar with baking soda, chemical change is happening. And then finally, if a solid forms, and this one, we can kind of go back to the milk. <laughs> if you pour your milk out onto your cereal in the morning and you haven't smelled it, um, 
again, you might be in for a horrible surprise because sometimes when milk goes bad, it goes bad enough that it forms a solid and you have chunky milk. Do not eat your cereal in that situation. Um, and so these five things are the indicators of a chemical change. Hey, that's pretty much it for unit three. Um, straightforward, simple. You should know this. Of course, as always, ask me questions if you've got them. Okay, bye guys.